I'm going to start with a, a, a brief account of historical change, which might disagree with a number of people here. I mean, you, might, you might find it a disagreeable account, but at least that can catalyze a conversation. And the relationship... Sorry, just turn my stopwatch on. Don't be like spiked. Um, um, uh, the relationship between this notion of historical change, um, political tendencies historically, and then the movements we've seen over the last two years, and then a, a, a final question. So <clears throat> David Harvey, in his reading of Marx's Capital, um, isolates a footnote in chapter 15, and he says that this um, kind of is the most explicit articulation of Marx's understanding of historical change. Uh, so he says that this is an assemblage Marx's understanding of history uh, and the historical movement is an assemblage of six fields. Uh, mental conceptions, technology, modes of production, reproduction of life, social relations, and a relationship to nature. Um, and he says that the, the movement of capitalism, the capitalist movement, which is the great, in terms of the successful revolution of the last half millennia, the last 500 years, it's the movement of capitalism and the capitalist mode of production. Um, he says that you can see that revolution being expedited in these six distinct fields. So what does that mean? Well, in the field of mental conceptions, it's John Locke um, and his notion of a fundamentalist notion of property rights. Uh, it's there in the technological change of the spinning jenny and Watt's steam engine. It's there in the political revolutions of the glorious revolution of 1688 and 1789 and arguably 1989 as well. 1989 as well. Um, so uh, this movement, the successful revolution of capitalism, in the, the capitalist mode of production, one might argue, reading Harvey's take on chapter 15 of Marx's Capital, um, goes through these six fields. So moving on, I think uh, political traditions tend to isolate one of these particular fields within this assemblage and say that this is the unique uh, field of political contestation. So anarchists sometimes, and I'm, I'm generalising here, I'm offering ideal types. Um, we all do it. Um, Anarchists will isolate social relations and say, this is the point of political contestation. This is it. You know, so micropolitics, for instance, the Foucauldian notion of uh, the micropolitics of one's everyday social relations with others. Uh, that's where power resides. That's where domination resides. That's what we have to transform our practice with, with regards to one, one another every day on a micropolitical level. So that's maybe something we see with the anarchist tradition. The, the Trotskyist tradition, uh, they would say we need to seize power, right? This is about, uh, we need to take a certain apparatus. Um, um, but they don't necessarily look at questions of technology, uh, or they didn't historically. So 1917, the Russian Revolution, politically a very successful revolution, on a par with 1688 and 1789, right? But it didn't have a reflective understanding of technology. So you have in the 1920s and 1930s, I'm sure many of you know, time motion studies conducted in the Soviet Union, um, the implementation of Taylorite reforms with regards to industrial production. Broadly speaking, the same kinds of uh, reforms that are actually going on in Western Europe and North America with regards to the industrial process. There's still a, a, a maintenance of what Marx refers to as the ontological inversion, that the human subject is subordinate to the commodity object and the industrial process. That was still there in the Soviet Union. Some people talk about the Soviet Union being a form of communism. I, I have to disagree because there was still the ontological version, inversion of the, the object and the, the technological process, the production process, being of primacy above that of the human subject. Um, uh, so, you know, anarchists, Trotskyists, uh, hold on. A, a famous uh, point, um, Trotsky said that the destruction of fixed capital, i.e. You know, technology, you know, an assembly line. He said this was an act of terrorism on a par with murder. Um, this is, you know, in contrast to people like the Luddites, for instance, who said, we will destroy technologies which are uh, problematic or undermine commonality. So they had a very, uh, actually quite a sophisticated understanding of how technology can uh, embody certain social relations, embody certain ideologies, arguably more sophisticated than Trotsky's understanding of technology. Um, arguably. Um, I, would, I would say that. Um, so, yeah. Right. So, moving on now to the movements that we see and their relationships to these different fields of contestation. Um, if we look at, for instance, uh, some of the more reproductive movements, the socially reproductive movements, as has been touched on by Silvia so Federici and Kathy Weeks, uh, the 15M, IWS, or the Occupy movement more broadly, they isolate particular fields such as that of uh, social relations or um, mental conceptions, right? And they say we need to transform 
these particular fields. So in terms of social relations, they say we need to uh, reimagine uh, our relationships with one another. And in terms of social reproduction, they might start looking at new ways of feeding one another, housing each other, clothing, and so on, which I think was a discussion before us. I heard people screaming about social reproduction. I don't know. Um, but that's where they're very good. Where they're very bad is the production process. So how do you build, then, a political economy, a mode of production, upon these kinds of social relations you want to see? How do you have an assembly line? Would you have an assembly line? How do you make clothes? How do you build houses? They haven't gone to that level where they start to talk about political economy based upon the kinds of social relations they want to see. So that's, that's OWS, for instance, in the 15M. The Pirate Party, very successful in Germany, or the Five Star Movement in Italy, uh, they're very keen to talk about technology and the impact that technology can have on not just organising, but in terms of a new economy. And they say, look, austerity is not that bad. We can expedite the process of austerity through using new technologies. So, you know, they think that technological change is a really important point of political contestation, and yet uh, they don't necessarily reimagine social relations. Uh, so, for instance, the Pirate Party in Germany is, from what I've been told, quite misogynistic on, on issues of racism and so on. They, they make some pretty outrageous statements, um, but that's because they don't see it as a, as a field of political contestation. What they think is innovative and where they think they can engage is the field of technology. Again, I'm generalising. Um, and I think it's because we don't actually look at all of these distinct fields in the entirety of this assemblage, technology, social relations, productive processes. They all need to be transformed in order to have a mode of production after capitalism. All of them, every single one of them. We're going to need, as a movement, our James Watts. We're going to need, and I hate to list men, we won't have men, by the way, <laughs> but this is the capitalist movement has mostly men. We're going to need our James Watts, we're going to need our John Locks and our Thomas Hobbes, our John Rawls, our Robert Notzik. We're going to need our, uh, you know, uh, Oliver Cromwells. Um, but it's going to be in all these different fields, political revolutions, technological movement, social relations, social reproduction, mental conceptions. You need all of it to transform society, not just one. It's not just a legislative process where you seize power, but it's also not just a process. I think it's a false binary that's set up between Marxists and anarchists. By the way, I, I probably self-identify as a libertarian Marxist. Um, you know, this is the exclusive field of transformation that will then lead to a new society. It's actually the whole assemblage, in my, in my opinion. Um, so, final point. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Yeah, not bad for once. Um, people talk about building a new left. And I was in a really great talk previously with Luke Cooper and Simon Hardy, and people talking about, how do we build a new left? I'm not actually that interested in building a new left. I want a new mode of production. I think building a new left is instrumental to having a new mode of production, but the summum bonum, the highest good for me, isn't building a new left. The highest good is a new mode of production. Um, and I think too frequently, when people say we need to build a left, uh, to use kind of psychoanalytic language, this to me sounds like a fetish object. Um, and we need to be very reflective about the role of the fetish object and the party form in the 20th century, right? Not just on the left, but also on the, on the right. It was quite, an, you know, you look at the collective fetish object of the Nazi party in Germany. Fetish objects with regards to power uh, and with regards to social change don't have a particularly good history, right? Um, so, <laughs> yes, that wasn't a joke. Um, so my, my interest isn't so much building a left, it's about a new mode of production. I think that's going to require change in all six fields. Um, in fact, I'll put it to people here, and hopefully this will catalyze some real kind of vociferous hatred towards me. I would, I would contend, I would contend, the only thing that can save European capitalism is an under-consumptionist left without a critical understanding of political economy and without a critical understanding of the present mode of production. It's the only thing that will save European capitalism. It's the, it's the only thing, right? What expedites global capitalism after 1945? It's an internationalization of the New Deal. What, what saves capitalism after the crisis of 29 to 33? It's what Paolo Werner calls the socialism of capitalism, which is the institutional inclusion of trade union movements. Right? It's the Wagnerites in the US where capitalist states actually start to allow closed shop organising. There's a reason why they do that. Right? Um, so we need to be very clear. I'm happy in building a left, but at the same time, if it's an under-consumptionist left which doesn't have sufficient critique of the present mode of production and its limitations, and how it will always subordinate the human subject to the object of the production process, uh, then we're in trouble. So that's uh, a point I guess I would start on and maybe we can move on to.
right. So um, following up from that, um, which is actually a bit hard. Um, well, um, let's. Um, having been involved in the Occupy movement in London, um, I'm using that now as sort of a bit more of a concrete example of one of the uh, one of the uh, things that we can draw lessons from. Because basically, what we're here today to talk about is lessons from social movements and how we can move forwards, uh, bearing those lessons in mind. And um, looking at the Occupy movement, one of the things that we can ask is what it means to resist and how that was a form of resistance and how it was also not a form of resistance. Um, it was What was really interesting about the Occupy movement was how it was very locally rooted, but also very global. So you had the sort of imagination of the uh, bigger global struggle and the connection with the Occupy Wall Street with global capitalism um, and a range of other sort of ideas about how we wanted to restructure the world but also starting to realize that you have to build it locally. Um, so the Occupy movement in London had a very clear idea of certain things they wanted to restructure. It had a, a, This often gets sort of lost in debate but it had a 10-point statement that was um, that was uh, consensus agreed by 500 people on the second day of the occupation, saying that uh, it, uh, the the current system is undemocratic, unsustainable, unjust, but also saying very concrete things against tax havens and for um, cross uh, collaboration with uh, unions and other struggles, um, which well not unions but um, student movements and other struggles, which often gets lost. Um, the point of that is that we have to start thinking or the opponent show the power of thinking wider than just the left and just the um, against the rest, so to speak. Um, but at the same time, there was a um, what I, the dilemma or what I always want to call the tyranny of inclusiveness within the Occupy movement, precisely because after a while, the sort of radical inclusiveness meant that things there were certain words and certain things that we weren't allowed to talk about almost, such as anti-capitalism, um, which a lot of people who came to the occupation in the beginning were labeling themselves anti-capitalist and were shot down by others saying um, that we shouldn't be saying anti-capitalist because some people felt alienated by the word anti-capitalism, um, which over the course of the occupation, of course, meant that the people who were anti-capitalist felt alienated by the people who were trying to silence them from talking about anti-capitalism, which again then led to a sort of de-radicalization of what, to begin with, was a very radical movement. Um, so there's a sort of risk of being locked into particular dynamics. And uh, I think one of the lessons that we can draw from that is that we have to sort of actually safeguard how we, what sort of spaces we maintain and how they are maintained. Uh, because if we start silencing particular forms of behavior because they are deemed too radical uh, in, in the lesson of, in, in the sort of spirit of inclusiveness, then we actually risk uh, losing the radicality and the subversiveness of what we do. Um, at the same time, Occupy must be said to have done a lot of very good things during the course of the occupation, uh, most notably the sort of Ten City University and the public assemblies, uh, which were very open and inclusive also of people who weren't necessarily activists or very radical to begin with. A lot of people actually became activists through being involved at St. Paul's. And um, precisely because they came down to start for curiosity because it was public and in an open space and uh, started being taken seriously and listened to. And I think that lesson of actually listening to the people that we are talking to when we are sort of... Um, someone in the previous panel said that the importance of um, actually... No, not in the first panel of today, uh, that uh, the importance of saying we're not all super, sort of these super subjects of resistance, that actually some of us are just normal people, is really, really important and is something that um, the St. Paul's movement showed that it 
has a larger effect and it captures people's imagination. The Penn State University was a great example because it really got people together and collect and sort of was a, an education of both radical academics and not so radical academics and uh, general public who would never really go to an academic talk and suddenly connected to it. Um, and these kinds of things, also the sort of radical egalitarianism of sharing in the camp that really functioned to begin with, uh, but was stretched because it was trying to sort of maintain that open space in a city that was is not very open, uh, shows that we can build these alternatives and they are very feasible, but we have to fight for them and we have to safeguard them from outside. And we have to also be flexible and to move on and to find different ways of organizing. And uh, um, the Occupied Times, which came out of the Occupy, sort of, which started at St. Paul's, has carried on and kept moved, sort of has actually become a much bigger team after the occupation has ended, uh, which shows that there is still room for that sort of organizing, uh, but in different forms and different formats. And I think we have to sort of, the meaning of what a public space is and how we maintain that public space is open. Am I doing for time? Yeah, got two, minutes. two minutes, yeah. How we sort of move forwards by shifting formats, I think is really important uh, because these struggles, like we see synergies and we see convergences between struggles and we have to keep sort of identifying that what we believe in and what we don't believe in in each of them so that we um, keep it uh, clear that, the, for example, the OT is very anti the, or very against the, the, some of the sort of ethos of the mainstream media, well, most of the ethos of the mainstream media, which work on a, a completely different logic. We maintain an open space. We publish activists and academics and... Uh, we have a radical ethos of sort of complete hier non-hierarchy uh, and every decision is collective and no one speaks on behalf of the newspaper and no one speaks on behalf of any of us. I think those sort of, it takes lessons from the Occupy movement and it also carries it into a different um, format. And um, I think I'm out of time, so... I'll sort of end it on that note of um, being in control of our communication channels is, the, is a really crucial thing, but also being reflected on how we communicate and that we, in communicating, build towards that future that we want to see. Okay, thanks, Reginald. I'm um, actually, uh, just before I pass the mic to James, I just wanted to ask you a very quick question. I wonder if you could uh, give me a very quick reply as well. It's, does Occupy, I mean, we heard a lot about it uh, last year, does it have any kind of ongoing organisational existence? And if so, uh, what, what are you guys uh, up to? Just very quickly, yeah. Um, okay, well, I think um, I'll say I sort of more identify as uh, Occupied Times... Um, and the Occupy movement as a wider thing rather than Occupy London specifically, partly also because I'm not really based in London anymore and because a lot of, um, a lot of what the o Occupy London has become after St. Paul's is something that is very disputed um, by a number of people. Uh, but Occupy ha London has been involved... People from Occupy London have, for example, been involved in... in occupying the Fry and Barnet Library in North London and maintaining that as an open space. Um, but a lot of these new initiatives aren't sort of, you know, they identify with the larger Occupy umbrella rather than sort of being, I think we have to look rather at, rather than sort of looking at the Occupy London brand, so to speak, looking at what individuals are doing. Thanks for that. Uh, the reason I just sort of came back on that is so I thought one of the things we might want to discuss after this is how do these movements that sort of burst onto the scene maintain any kind of ongoing 
infrastructure in existence and, you know, beyond just the sort of short, uh, exciting, uh, effervescent moments that we know them for, and if, if that's something that we could perhaps come back on. Um, we're going to hear from uh, James now. So, uh, James. Hi. Uh, I hope people don't mind if I sit so I can actually see my notes while I'm speaking. Um, looking at me is probably not that thrilling. Um, so, I mean, to, to come, I mean, I've, I've, I found, in, in fact, that question very interesting because I, I think, and I would argue, that the Occupy movement is dead, uh, and certainly, certainly, the Occupy movement in London is dead. It died uh, a long time ago, um, and, and this is partly to do with no longer having the space which which it had. Um, but this is, this is, I think, uh, an, an interesting place to start, which is to ask, you know, why is it the case that the sort of the the most public and sort of uh, most imagination capturing, certainly the most media capturing. Uh, social movement uh, of, the, of the last few years has been this, this kind of grabbing and seizing sort of public space, the, 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 des the desire to, to assemble uh, in public uh, in this way, in, in, in a way that, that isn't, uh, as, as we might expect to have been historically the case, uh, you know, an assembly within a workplace or uh, within a particular neighborhood. It's, it's this, this strange and sort of synthetic um, uh, uh, assembly uh, in one place, and this is this is a, a good place to start. The other place to start is 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 to say that this session is 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 supposed to talk about new movements. Well, I don't think the movements of the last five years are particularly new. Actually, I think the Occupy movement is the latest uh, incarnation of. Uh, what some people have called the movement of movements that sort of uh, that had its roots in in kind of the practices uh, of uh, the anti-capitalist movement of the late 90s and goes back beyond that to, to various sort of uh, anarchist or anti-capitalist movements before then. So 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 the point to make here is that that actually the, these new movements are, have a, a kind of historical connection and, and that connection is is often a formal one. I mean, often they they involve the same people, but 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 it's often a formal one as well in that that they maintain the kind of same technology of organising this sort of formal question. About uh, how one organises uh, via consensus or, or whatever. So that's that's one thing to note. Um, and to say, and, and, and so I am going to throw out a few questions here about about the, these sort of new movements. And, and of course, I, and Guy was outlining at the start these various sort of uh, instantiations of resistance or, 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 or political motion. The one the one that you didn't mention were the riots. Right, and th this is uh, this is one thing to say is that uh, you know, this is this is rarely on the agenda for a left conference, but to say uh, that, that all these things which were carried out by relatively respectable and politicised, and formally politicised people who have some idea of what they want, these were real and legitimate political movements, whereas this was just whatever some kind of neoliberal shopping or whatever it is that the reactionaries on the left would say. I, I, it's not what <laughs> I think you're saying, but 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 this is a canard that, that ought to be challenged and challenged quite heavily. So so that that's one thing that, that we do have to consider. Uh, what I would say is, when, so, uh, so these movements arise uh, in moments of antagonism and then fall away into sort of either discursive production, and this is, I think, uh, probably the most worthwhile remnant of the Occupy movement in London has fallen in with sort of the occupied times and is interested in reflecting on questions about, you know, uh, what the direction is to take. So we fall into to, to discursive production or simply recuperation. And I think we had a speaker from Spiked magazine earlier, and that will tell you a lot about that movement. Um, so, I mean, you have the, the say, Guy mentioned this, these series of sort of synthetic movements. As, and, and when I say synthetic movement, I mean here that, that, that as, as Rajan was pointing out, at, at the St. Paul's encampment, you had uh, self defined sort of communists, you know, radical leftists, as well as uh, liberals, uh, sort of liberal left ish, uh, sort of, or just concerned people who didn't know uh, what, what they believed or, or what they wanted out of things. And this is one of the things to point out about this is that, that these, are, these, these movements tend to arise in coalition between uh, people on the radical left uh, and, and sort of concerned citizens of some kind or another. And, and this is one of the things that makes them interesting, but it also throws up uh, some difficult questions about you know, what we do and how we operate. Uh, in them, I don't think the kind of uh, uh, notion of a kind of uh, uh, radical entryism in these movements is is sustainable. In fact, I think one of the great achievements uh, of of uh, the anti-capitalist movement, and then you know, which we saw instantiated in, in the Occupy movement, was to re remove the possibility for entryism. Uh, I think it's ultimately toxic. Um, so, so that's that's to one side. One of the things that, that strikes me in looking at these movements is is what emerges as a desire for respectability. This, I think, is pernicious and dangerous and should be avoided. 
Um, so this desire to, to say immediately, oh, you know, we have to uh, make ourselves look respectable for the media. Uh, oh my God, the media will never cover us if we say outrageous things like I want to destroy capitalism. Uh, I think we should hang bankers from lampposts. Uh, things like this. Um, and, and, and this is, this is, you know, this is, this is one of the things. And, and you know, Rajan mentioned this, and it's one of the reasons that I disengaged actually after a couple of months uh, spent at, at St Paul's and working at St Paul's was this continual insistence that one could not say in public what one really believed. Uh, and this, I think, you know, is is ultimately a recipe for failure. It's a recipe for recuperation. It's a recipe for ending up as an acolyte of Lord Glasman in the Labour Party, which is you know, one of the directions that, that people... So, so this is nonsense and, and, and it should be combated and I don't think that's a, a controversial motion at all. Um, but I want to ask why it is never the time to say uh, we are an anti-capitalist movement, we are a communist movement, in fact. And this is one of the things I think Savoy Zizek, and I don't agree with Zizek on much, uh, his sort of wild public racism, ridiculousness, uh, whatever. Um, but one of the things I would say that, that, that Zizek said when he was visiting uh, uh, Occupy New York, I uh, was to say, look, you have had your anti-communist fun, it is time again to reclaim that word. Uh, to, to take up that word again. Um, and I think it, it's useful to, at this point to step back and say we're at a juncture now, uh, and, and it's one of the things that has been on people's lips today uh, that, that it has made me very happy to see is, is people saying, look, uh, we have suffered a 30-year, 40-year defeat here. We had the collapse of the Soviet Union. That wasn't necessarily a bad thing, but what it did mean uh, was that it, it was impossible in the world to realize uh, uh, that, 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 that there was an alternative way of organizing uh, life, production, social reproduction. It, this makes it very, you know, very difficult. Um, what I would say is that, the, that there are three historical moments here. You, you have a historical moment uh, in the time of, say, Marx, uh, and, and, and uh, which is a time in which you know, people are attempting to bring to birth uh, or, or, or to, to point out that there is in countervalence to capitalism a communist movement. It exists. You then have a second phase in which you know, the seizure of state, state power uh, or attempts to seize state power are, are, are used to bring sort of communism into existence. This failed, right? Uh, this, <laughs> uh, the state of the world as it is will tell us that this has failed. We are now in a third juncture which has more in common with Marx's time than it does with ours. Um, this points to us this points to us needing to operate uh, both discursively and actively. And this is a, you know, a question, I think, uh, that's worth considering about these new movements. And uh, one of the things I hear leveled uh, as a critique of these movements, which I think is legitimate, is to say, that, look, these are people with uh, you know, relatively little uh, in terms of a worked out program, uh, in terms of you know, uh, what they want to see economically. I mean, this is the, a point I think Aaron was making earlier, was to say, that, oh, you know, the, the Occupy movement had, was focusing almost so, exclusively on social reproduction, had very little uh, to do sort of, uh, with most production. It's not entirely true, in fact. I mean, there is a sort of um, mystical science of economy that, that, that circulates within these movements, which has something to do with uh, f fractional reserve banking and, and all that sort of uh, superstition. Um, uh, so, so <laughs> that, that, I mean, that's one thing to say. Um, the other thing that concerns me here is, is, is uh, two questions and two related questions. Uh, one is about the sort of uh, uh, individualization of the political subject in these movements, right? So uh, politics is simply a question um, of an action that you will undertake because you are convinced... Uh, of the particular virtue of, of this course of undertaking and questions about collectivity or organization beyond uh, your, your own particular commitment to an idea uh, don't really get anywhere. So you have this notion that, oh, I can come into an assembly whenever I want and I can leave it whenever. Well, this leads to the situation that we see in which people sort of emerge, drop out, emerge, drop out again. And perhaps this is the new model of political commitment. If that's the case, then we need to start thinking seriously about ways in which we deal with a sustainable and ongoing movement in which people can enter and come out again. This might be a better, a better way of doing things than, than we have had historically, in which people empty, empty out their entire internal existence and subjectivity into attempting to bring about a revolution and then burn out and die uh, when these things fail. Uh, this, this works. I mean, worth saying. So, I mean, I'm, there are other things to say here. One is about sort of the rise of direct action movements, uh, movements that target uh, structures at the point of consumption. Uh, so, most of the direct action movements you see at the moment are, 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 are you know, so sitting or standing outside shops. Uh, and this is uh, uh, one of these things that has arisen recently, I think, is interesting to talk about because this is action at the point of consumption rather than production or the, uh, the point of exchange. And, and, and if this is a tactic that's important, then we need to talk and think about it. Um, the other thing to say 
is this question uh, about secessionism, uh, a kind of left secessionism, ontological or political secessionism, the notion uh, that one can simply uh, grab together a bunch of saintly and well-intentioned people and remove oneself from the world entirely and thus prefigure uh, the future simply by uh, camping in a square uh, or living in a particularly virtuous squat. Uh, this, to me, doesn't seem like a solution but we should talk about the ways in which this is attractive to people, and attractive in a way that sort of uh, interfactional fights between heterodox and orthodox Trotskyists or anarchists and Marxists uh, simply are not. Uh, I think that matters. Okay, thanks, James. Um, so I'm going to open it up uh, to the floor for uh, questions and comments uh, and we can have a discussion. I'm just as a side point, when I'm doing this, when I'm checking my phone, that's not me being antisocial and texting people. Uh, I'm, I'm interacting on Twitter. There's people watching on the live stream as well. It's being, it's being hyper-social, not antisocial. Uh, thank you, Erin. Um, okay. Uh, well, I'm glad James uh, mentioned the UK riots there because, I mean, I do want to sort of explicitly include that in, in the discussion because um, when people sort of try and distance themselves saying they've got underdeveloped political consciousness or they're far too contentious in their actions towards the police, the authorities. I mean, I certainly find that, um, you know, as problematic as James does. And one of the things I'd like to also have a look at is, is there a common thread running through these different movements between the UK riots, the indignados, right, uh, the Occupy Wall Street, uh, between, you know, are, are there commonalities? And if so, what are they? I mean, one of the things it strikes me that they're about re reclaiming uh, the commons, reclaiming public space. Uh, they're uh, opposing themselves to the state and official authorities rather than trying to uh, work within them. So what are the, the commonalities there? And another thing I thought would be interesting uh, to try and develop and, and bring out in the discussion is, you know, the, 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 the political subjects that we're seeing uh, in these movements. I mean, James has said they're not new movements, but certainly I think you agree that they're not totally familiar uh, to us as the working class traditionally conceived, which is, of course, the wage labourer who enters the market and sells his labour, her labour to, to the factory owner and so on. Uh, these are, you're seeing people uh, who are in relationships of debt, right, which is a more moralised hierarchical uh, relationship. So, so what are the possibilities uh, for thinking about... Um, debt as a relationship and you're also seeing people who are I think in the the UK riots who are sort of uh, resisting the sort of securitization and militarization of uh, you know the, the state and its its uh, authority okay so those are just a few things I thought I'd throw it throw out there I'd like to go uh, to the audience now do we have a roving mic anywhere or uh, this is it okay I'm holding it so okay uh, is there anyone who is part of the conference organizer who's going to or do I have to go up? It's my job. Okay, all right. I'll, okay, it's a decentralised roaming mic being distributed on the basis of need. Um, okay, uh, so if you, I could see uh, hands going up. Uh, anyone have any questions, comments? I can see one over there. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Um, hi, hi. Um, I think the Occupy movement could be seen as a form of experimentation um, with a big focus on social reproduction, and I think it was good for that. Um, and I think people have, you know, people on the left, I think there's a problem in that they've read too much into it, and Occupy was made up of lots of different people. Um, but I think it was good in the fact that it was um, a form of experimentation that focused on social reproduction. And I don't think it matters so much that it's died down now, because you can see this st still ongoing discussions, um, and it's had an impact on other organisations and other thoughts and theories, etc. So I think it was good for that. Um, and other things have come out of it. For instance, in America, you've got the strike debt movement, which I think is very important, um, and similar things are happening here. Um, I think we do need to find a new mode of production, as, as Aaron Peters said. Um, I think that's crucial. Um, and I don't think there's any big... There's no visions out there at the moment, apart from, I would say, things like peer-to-peer -peer production, which um, is, is... There's some stuff around that. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a, that's a crucial point. Um, yeah, that's it. Hi. 
Um, I just want to say a couple of things that kind of goes across all um, three presentations. Was it more about this kind of um, coercive, the coercive power of, of capitalism um, and, and so a capitalist culture. So in talking about the difference between occupying the riots and this idea of like whether it was coherent and positions of legitimacy, um, Occupy, you could kind of, you could brand it. You couldn't really brand the riots. Yeah, there's no sort of hashtag riots. <laughs> there's a hashtag Occupy, yeah. Um, they did try and brand it, obviously, with a huge amount of criminalisation and stuff, the working class, blah, blah, blah. But you get my point. Um, with regards to technology, I think the biggest issue is we have to make a really clear distinction between kind of corporate-driven technology and what that means in terms of the culture that it creates. And then, like, other forms, so, like, you know, your blogs, your indie media, which are extremely, extremely useful. And the kind of the reason I'm saying that is because um, I, I teach them a lecture in sociology, and I engage regularly with loads of audiences who want me to sort of tell them my stuff in 140 characters or less, <laughs> right? And um, that's quite difficult. And um, there is kind of this, you know, idea about liking the revolution on Facebook, and it's really, really dangerous. <laughs> Um, and I, I just fear that we might sort of uh, fall in, into that trap. So just, yeah, the, the revolution or whatever you want to call it, it's not going to be in 140 characters or less. Um, so that was just it. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to pass it to the gentleman there? Uh, thank you. I'd just like to take up something that Aaron said, I think. Um, uh, but before I say that, I'd just like to say that there is a commonality between all these these movements, and that is the quite obviously the crisis of capitalism, which has uh, struck worldwide, and there's been a reaction worldwide from from the, the Arab Spring through to the movements in, we, we've seen in Europe. Um, and behind this, I, th I think we need to be quite clear that the, the, the the problem behind this is a structural problem of capitalism, that there is internal contradictions within capitalism which it cannot resolve. And th these contradictions are they're, they're internal to it because of the accumulation of capital. And the, the, there's resulting in an increase in capital in relation to labor in this, in the, it, employed by capital. The result is a decrease in the rate of profit, a, s a declining rate of profit. And um, Aaron said that he thought that a decrease in consumption of the working class would solve this problem. Well, and he defer. mentioned the, the New defer. Deal. Sorry? It could defer it. They never solve it. It could just defer, defer it. Yeah. Okay. And he mentioned the New Deal. Yeah. Um, I just want to say just something briefly on that. The New Deal, a similar problem arose in, the, in, the in 1929 with the reduction in the rate of profit and the bourgeoisie approached it very differently in the, in the, in the 20s. It was every state for themselves. They erected tariff barriers and they made the situation a lot worse and it, it uh, deteriorated much more dramatically. Today, they've learned a few things and they've attenuated the crisis, but it's still not actually in their ability to solve it. The only way they can solve it is through destruction of constant capital. And this was something which happened to an extent in, in the 30s, in the New Deal. But really, the solution in the 30s was the Second World War, the massive destruction of capital which occurred in the Second World War. And we're now in that situation now. So really, what we're faced with now is, the, is the, the issue of another world war or revolution and socialism. And the, the problems are really, I think, a, a, a lot more serious than the Occupy movement um, realized. And the... the, 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 the <laughs> The, the idea that the, somehow there could be some sort of incremental solution to this problem is, is actually wrong. I mean, something like in the 1920s, there was an occupation of the factories in Italy, which, you know, was, Gramsci was saying this was an idea 
which would, would lead to, to socialism. It was a movement that would lead to socialism. The question really was a question of political power and the power of the state, and the state power was not broken, and this whole movement collapsed, and we're in the same situation today. I'll wind up there. Thanks for that. Okay. Uh, I'm, for efficiency, I'm going to take a cluster of questions. Um, here you go. Can you, if you could keep them to maximum of uh, two minutes, and then I'm going to go back to you guys on the panel. So you've got four to choose from. Okay. Hi. Um, you've talked about how the Occupy movement was a reaction to a crisis in capitalism, but what I haven't heard from anybody is how these movements are also a response to a crisis in the form of democracy we have, which is representative democracy. just like to hear something on that. Okay, thanks. So, this is me doing my best impression of Jerry Springer. Um, okay. <laughs> Hopefully it won't get that rowdy, though. Um, right, so I'm going to go in the order uh, that they spoke. So, Aaron, if you'd like to go first. Cheers. Um, yeah, excellent questions. Um, just to reiterate the um, because I need to recall everything that was said it was one right who was second one two three. no no I'm just because there were obviously there were obviously and four there were uh, affinities between all the questions right um, yeah I mean the big difference between this crisis and of course the crisis of 29 to 33 is that in 1929 the US had only been the global hegemon hegemon whatever you want to call it for about 11 years right post-1918. So we didn't have the institutional knowledge about how to perpetuate... If, if you kind of go with people like Panitch, right? It didn't have the institutional knowledge and the mechanisms and the know-how to expedite the continuation of the global capitalism. It did after the Second World War. That took a very long time. And you get people like Acheson come along and so on. And they recognised the necessity of internationalising the New Deal. But I think the US in 2008 is a very different beast. And people like Geithner and so on can't be compared to the experts that would have been their uh, equivalents in 1929. Like you say, they are a, lot, are a lot better at dealing with firefighting, if not solving this crisis. Um, and I also agree that there is a, a secular crisis. I believe in the secular crisis. Uh, analytically, I think that's happening. It's observable. Um, and I don't think it's a cyclical crisis that can be solved. And even, I said, I said deferred or displaced. And David Harvey says that capitalism never solves its crisis. It merely displaces them. I don't see where it can displace them this time. Um, the period 1973 to 2008, which is sometimes described as the Belle Epoque of US capitalism, uh, you have a repression of wages um, for decades. But this is only possible because of the mass entry into a global labour market of China, East Asia, South Asia. So you then have very cheap imports of consumer durables. And you can therefore have very low inflation. Inflation targeting, of course, is a central part of monetary policy of the last several decades in the West. So they can do that with wage repression. When they have a doubling of the global labour market, that's not going to happen again. So there's all kinds of variables uh, to think about, really. Um, I'm going to answer two questions there, but also respond to James. You said that they had a political economy at Occupy. I don't think they did. They weren't talking about production. They were talking about monetary policy. Right? So they were talking about... No, but for, well, precisely, this is it. I mean, they were talking about fractional reserve lending. They were talking about, you know, uh, monetary policy. They weren't saying, how are we going to produce things? They weren't talking about it. I mean, I'm being genuinely serious here. Nobody is talking about this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is, there is, there beyond, oh, maybe John was. I mean, beyond, beyond uh, uh, P to P, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, Fiona? No, but you can respond. Time people no, certainly, but not. But what, I mean. There was social reproduction, but it wasn't a new production process. You weren't saying how we're going to build houses, how we're going to build cars. What, do we need cars? Do we, you know, do we need houses? Do we all live together? I mean, I, okay, I'm being, I'm being polemical, right? I'm being provocative. Um, with regards to, and then I'll, I'll shut up, um, the, the question of the riots, which is a really, really interesting one. My analysis of the riots, France 2005, Greece 2008, England 2011, um, is that there is the impossibility onto the entry of a la onto, of, of an entry into the labour market of this milieu, primarily a, an urban youth that can't enter the labour market, an impossibility of entering the labour market, as a consequence of the mechanisation and automation of labour, and of course the outsourcing of a number of jobs to other parts of the world. There's an impossibility of them entering the labour market. After 2008, that's then extended to a new milieu, which could be understood as the graduate of that future, and also increasingly precarious elements of the labour market, such as the public sector. 
Uh, so I think there's an interesting like congruence of subjectivities and interests that have happened after 2008. Um, so that's basically it. Maybe we can talk about the riots more in a second, but... Uh. Um, well, I mean, I would actually strongly disagree that no one really talked about um, different forms of social production in the Occupy camps. They did, but it wasn't the um, it wasn't the sort of overarching voice. But uh, there's a lot of people who were talking about, for example, cooperatives and uh, moving to sort of more collaborative forms of production. Um, on your point about communism, I would actually say the Occupy camps, in very many ways, function more like an anarchy. Um, I but think you're too, uh, terms. I um, well, um, I I disagree. But because um, um, coming when I'm not sort of doing all the wonderful things that guys that I do, um, I also study anthropology. And um, if you look at the structures of a lot of hunter gatherer societies, they are strikingly similar to uh, some of the sort of radical sharing that went on uh, in, within the camps and the sort of her, the sort of structuralist the structured structurelessness, so to speak, the the way that there was a sort of coherent structure even though people came and went and uh, everyone who came had the same right to participate, uh, those kinds of structures, even though there was no explicit theory about it. Um, and that's why I disagree about sort of anarchism, communism, but that's a different point. But, um, in relation to some of the questions, the representation and democracy... Um, yes, I think that was a crucial point in the Occupy uh, camps uh, responding to the sort of impossibility of having a political influence uh, because the consensus-based democracy meant that everyone had the same right to speak and everyone had the same right to be listened to and everyone had to be listened to because if you if you chose to block a proposal you actually stopped the whole process and it had to start over it had to sort of be worked out to a different outcome those kinds of things were really interesting radical experiments precisely because they've required the participation of everyone or for someone to say, okay, I acknowledge this problem, I'm going to stand aside from it. But again, I don't think this is something completely new in the Occupy camps. It carries it back to Latin America, to the Spanish movements. Um, it has a very, very long history. Um, so, yeah, I'll pass the mic on that, I think. Thank you. Uh, James? Yeah, so... And I think you know, we're both drawing from, from this question, wherever it came from, about uh, you know, Occupy as a response not simply to an economic crisis, but a, a democratic crisis as well. Yeah, I, I think that's true. Um, I think one, one dimension of it also uh, is, right, you know, and, and what I, I found so striking is that the, this is not people going out and joining parties, right? And I think this is an important uh, part of this. And, and you know, I, I speak to... Uh, Trotsky's friends who said, that, look, yes, we, we recognize that there's been something, something of a crisis in recruitment here, and actually, uh, if we'd only intensified our methods of recruitment, it would have been better. You know, my, my response to this is that, like, no, this is actually, you know, the, the reason people are opting for this is not because they're, they're unaware that you exist, it's because they don't want what you're offering. Um, it's a different thing. Um, so, so, but, I mean, one of the, so, you know, uh, one of the things I would say about, about you know, the, this question of uh, the form of the camp itself, Way it operates is that you know, I, I think it encountered one of the real problems with, you know, and I mentioned towards the end of what I was talking about, the, this question of sort of prefiguring um, or, or operating uh, a, a, a mode of existing and, and relating uh, that is nominally claims to be non capitalist while existing uh, nonetheless within. Uh, a, a globalized system of capitalism. This, I think, you know, it, when people do this, it encounters exactly the problems that, that we saw there, which is actually, you know, to, to my mind and, and, and in my analysis, and one of the ways that, that the occupying encampments ran was by way of a sort of actually sort of semi-public and semi-secret sort of bureaucracy of people who would never, who would sort of sort things out, you know, behind the scenes and spend time running around. So, so you know, this I mean, this I mean, this is always sort of a continual problem with these things. But what it had, on the other hand, was the, this kind of commitment to the notion that that you were kind of reconstituting some new kind of sovereignty by having everything dependent. Uh, on, on sort of consensus or, or sort of a common uh, sovereign body which is composed precisely of absolutely everyone involved. And this is intriguing and 
infuriating, actually, as well, and frustrating and, and bizarre and uh, frequently maddening. Um, so, I mean, so to leave that to one side, the, the other question I wanted to say is that, you know, I mean, you, you're opposing, I think, quite provocatively, perhaps, to say that, you know, that the question here is, you know, either global, global war or socialism, socialism or barbarism, I suppose, really. I mean, the other option is, of course, like, continued immiseration, right? I mean, this is, and I think this is one of the things to say, is that there is, there is a return of... Uh, to my mind, the, the, the intellectual credibility of what, has, you know, what is called the immiseration thesis uh, when people are talking about Marx is to say that, look, you know, actually, if you analyze the way that things are going, so you, you talk you know, at a very simple level, like the restructuring of low-wage labor in the UK by the imposition of workfare, which means that you precarize an entire uh, sort of segment of the class. Um, yeah, I think you know, the, the, the third option here and the, the option that I actually think is more likely to be imposed on us is uh, immiseration and, and uh, immiseration in far greater forms, the loss of all social compacts, uh, all socialized uh, uh, guarantees that exist uh, as we stand. I think that's uh, the crisis that we're heading towards and need to get really serious about. Okay, thanks, James. Um, so, uh, second round of questions. I'm going to prioritize questions on this side uh, this time. Uh, okay, right, so here we go. Um, there you go. Uh, my name is John Bywater. Um, I just had a quick question about the mode of production that thing that Aaron talks about. And um, the question is really how... Uh, this is a kind of old question for me. I keep asking it, but nobody seems to have a good answer. Uh, how is the mode of production itself going to be produced? By which mode of production is, the mode of, is, is a new mode of production going to be produced? And I think that um, the very, perhaps a very quick answer to that would be just to resource directly, just to appropriate um, the most advanced modes of production within within capitalist industry, and perhaps, um, I mean, Deleuze talks about, um, you know, we said we've always, been cap we've always been Marxists, where we think that, you know, capital has inner limits, and, but an outer limit, which is capital itself, and if uh, that limit is the command of capital over labour, then it, the limit is basically that um, capitalist production can only proceed so far under the command of capital over labour. And so there's a cooperative aspect of production which comes out, which Marx talks about in the Grundrisse, which um, kind of you can, you can perhaps see, I mean, it's not necessarily uh, the case, but perhaps we can see that within the more agile and lean aspects of, of manufacturing and software development. Um, and, and perhaps when we're talking about building movements and things, we could perhaps just couple up those um, incremental ways and effective, adequate capacity-producing ways of, of, of producing things into the more revolutionary goals so that we could actually, you know, kind of jumpstart jump start them. Okay, thanks. Um, so I saw people's hands dash up. I'm going to go for one question here then at the back. Um, okay. Uh, thanks. My name is Johnny Jones, and I work on the International Socialism Journal. I just want to make three points. Um, the first one, in relation to the question about old and new anti-capitalism, um, I think that we have to... Uh, see the links and the points of rupture between the movements that we've seen in the past two years or so and, and, the, and the, you know, the post Seattle kind of movement. And I think that while there are a lot of commonalities, there's a crucial difference, which is that the new uh, uh, anti-capitalism, if you like, has emerged at a time where capitalism is revealed not simply as a nasty system, but also as an unstable one. Um, and I think that that opens up new possibilities in terms of people who are involved in those movements transcending simply a moralistic critique of capitalism and moving towards uh, a much more generalised uh, critique of capitalism um, as, 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 a, as, a, as a system which we don't just go around saying, isn't it really horrible what it does in the third world? Um, although, of course, it does. Um, the second thing is on the form and, and, and of the occupations. Uh, and why is it that they took these forms? Well... You know, Trotsky talks about how uh, revolutionary movements proceed by a process of successive approximations. And I think that you can see an extent of this on a global scale with the occupations. Why is it that uh, in uh, uh, Porta del Sol, the, uh, the Indignados had an occupation? It's because of what happened in Tahrir Square. I, don't think, I think that sometimes we can, uh, we can look too far uh, to try and uh, uh, understand what had gone on, when actually the, the, the obvious answer is staring us in the face. I mean, the, there was an attempt to replicate that, that, you know, to take up a really horrible and reductionist uh, concept of the meme. Um, but it's useful in terms of talking about people saw it and they, and they tried to do it um, themselves. And, of course, what the, the benefit of that was 
um, was that it gets around the thorny issue of organisation. If you're occupying somewhere, you don't need to think about how we maintain structures, how we maintain organisation, because we can all just sit here uh, and we can carry on discussing things. Of course, the problem is that it's unsustainable, and particularly uh, in, the, in terms of how do you involve much wider layers of people than people who can just sit in a, t in a square all the time, but also in the face of state repression, and I think that that is a, is a big problem. And just very quickly, the final point I wanted to make is that on this question of a new left or a new mode of production, uh, I think that's a very undialectical way <laughs> of talking about things, and I know that you're trying to be pr uh, provocative, but we have to look at how these things are uh, incredibly uh, closely uh, interconnected. It's very good to use it as an antidote to the old reformist slogan from, you know, from Edward Bernstein right up to Tony Benn of the movement is everything and the, and the goal is nothing. But actually, I think that uh, if, we, if we think about how uh, uh, communism as the real movement to abolish the present state of things and communism as being uh, the imminent critique of capital, then we have to think about how does it arise from the movement and how do we connect... Uh, where people are today with where we want to go. That's something I think that Trotsky was very good at, and I think that it is also something that points to the continuing relevance of organisation, of revolutionary organisation, and the ability to have uh, networks of revolutionaries who are embedded within the movement but who are also able to generalise uh, and centralise the, the, the lessons of the movement. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay, question right at the back there in the middle. Can you pass this down? Um, Nick Rack, uh, Independent Socialist Network. I just wanted to come back, if I may, on the question that was raised and, and perhaps add a little bit about was Occupy and the other movements that we've seen a, re a reaction against the state of politics at the moment. And I think, it, it inevitably, it, it's part of that. But uh, it, it's reflected in every aspect of our society, isn't it? I mean, if you look at the recent by-elections, the non-participation in those by-elections by large sections of working class people is uh, an indication about how alienated the political system has become for growing numbers of what you know is pejoratively perhaps referred to as ordinary ordinary people that basically what we have um, and it's it, it's tied into other themes of today the absence of an alternative, which you can factor in the collapse of the Soviet Union, the strange paradox that this perversion of socialism and this bastardization, which wasn't socialism, is somehow understood as an alternative to capitalism. When that goes, what's the alternative? And so, again, um, tapping into something that Mark Fisher was saying, the absence of that alternative on the news. So when you have a discussion about austerity, the discussion is about, well, to what degree do we need austerity? There is never anybody who goes on the media from our point of view that says, no, austerity is making us pay for your system's crisis. And the parties that seek to win support from those working class people, whether it's in Rotherham or Middlesbrough or Croydon or Cardiff or Manchester Central or whatever, essentially nobody is going and discussing with those people. Somebody raised a, a question in a session this morning about how do we engage with working class kids on the estate well frankly there's a simple answer to that we go and talk to them but there is no party that does that anymore there's nobody that goes and talks to working class people working class communities has political discussions with them discusses the relevance of politics with working class people and the people that appeal for their vote are all representatives of the same ideology with different amounts of salt and pepper and that's what we've got to confront. We've got to discuss how do we intrude on their discussion. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I know there are a fair few hands that are still up, but uh, I think we're already 25 minutes over running, and I want to keep it to 75 minutes, so I'm going to go back to our panel now. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, if you could keep it fairly brief. You don't have to answer all the questions. Um, just select the ones you're interested in. I'm going to go to Aaron again in the same order that they spoke. So, Aaron. Um, yeah, uh, quick question about, you know, sorry, the point. I think we need to be very clear about the specificities of each country. 
So I don't disagree necessarily with what you're saying about um, uh, Spain and Egypt. But Cairo has something which is called, you know, you've got the Athens effect, right? Athens has 50% of the Greek population. If Athens goes up in flames, Greece is up in flames. That's not necessarily the same with regards to the United Kingdom if something occurs in London um, to the same extent. Likewise, Cairo, there's a disproportionate number, amount of the population living in Cairo that isn't the case, say, in the US living in New York, right? You about a third, quarter of the overall population is living in Cairo. There's a metropolitan bias in Egypt that there isn't in the United States. Specificity with regards to French electoral turnout. Hollande, massive turnout. Obama, massive turnout. That won't be replicated here. So I think we need to be careful about how many similarities there are. I think each country has its own specificity. Um, and that obviously has implications for how we organise. Um, uh, we see that also manifest. 15M, where's it gone? A lot of the energy is now going into movements for regional autonomy, particularly Catalonia, right? That's not going to happen in the United Kingdom because we haven't had the same historical experience of, you know, the nation state as those constituent elements of the Spanish nation state have. So I think there are differences, right, that are going on. Um, with regards to your saying, well, where does a new mode of production come from? That's what I was talking about. So I'm saying history is an assemblage of all these different fields, and it's only from all of these things changing that you have a new mode of production. I don't think we talk enough, and I'll only say this in our finish. I don't think we talk enough about what is capitalism no, as a mode of production, about exchange value, uh, where did this come from, how did it start, how it's premised on accumulation by dispossession, right? primitive, primitive accumulation, the, the highland clearances, the lowland clearances, uh, famine in Ireland and Bengal, all had to happen for British capitalism to be where it is today. We don't talk about these things, I don't think. Um, so what would something like post-capitalism look like? Well, it's the abolition of exchange value. What does that mean? I don't think enough people are having that conversation to even begin to talk meaningfully about, well, a mode of production beyond capitalism. Because I don't think enough people isolate what capitalism itself is. So, um, And I also wouldn't necessarily think capitalism is just one thing, because it takes on multiple different forms. Um, I mean, I'm originally Norwegian, and uh, if you look at how capitalism is playing out in Norway, uh, it's uh, treating its citizens very well. That doesn't mean that Norway is not massively implicated in capitalism. That doesn't mean that Norway isn't part of the part of a massive system of exploitation and has interests in has shares in corporations that do horrible things in different countries. That doesn't mean that people in Norway necessarily realise that because um, they have a very good welfare state as well. So capitalism sort of there provides for, for the whole country, which makes the political situation very different. And that is coming back to the sort of crisis representation there as well because it's a much smaller country and it provides well for its citizens. So even though it is, um, it actually shows how when people actually feel that the government provides for them, they tend to not really um, do anything against the system. And so even though a lot of Norwegians know all of this in theory, they don't. there was no Occupy in Norway, apart from sort of 20 people in the square. Um, it's, it, it's a cold country, yes, but it was also partly because people don't feel the sort of need to do it because they aren't as precarious situated as a lot of other people um, true um, and uh, also just what mode of production is by which mode of production does new mode of production come about um, I think it's also about the words that we use and how we talk about bringing it forth because what we saw in in the Occupy Council was precisely by the abolition of a lot of radical words and the the potential of reorganising and rethinking actually shrinks and it's illustrated very well by it's, sort of the, it's not the crisis of capitalism Cri capitalism is crisis and um, it, there is no such thing as ethical capitalism or moral capitalism um, and all of these sort of semi-liberal quasi uh, quasi um, neoliberal terms and that's sort of a step, if we can take a lesson from that, is to just keep carrying that forward and to sort of actually insist on it to sort of work everyday working class people and go to talk to them. Uh, because it's not like we're massively separate from them. I mean, I grew up in a working class neighborhood. Uh, so it's not like we're moving completely different worlds and we have to 
remember that. Thank you. Uh, James? Uh, so, uh, yeah, what was I going to say? <laughs> right, the, 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 I mean, that question of, uh, from the, 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 or the contribution Johnny was making, the, the, this, so this, this, one of the things I think we have to be careful about is, is saying that, so I agree in principle, I think uh, the, the form taken by the Occupy movement was indebted heavily to Tahrir uh, and, and to the Indignados. Um, that, that to, me, to me is without question, I don't like the word meme. Um, I think it's a stupid term, um, but but the thing is, like these these, these things, uh, you know, this happens quite a lot, right? In in sort of left political life, it's like people see something going on over there and say, uh, oh, we should do something over here like that. That's a really good technique over there, and they either take root or they don't, uh, and they take root for reasons, and those reasons are objective and material. Um, I, so, I mean, in this case, like, one of the reasons to, to look again at the Occupy movement is to say, yes, like, it has this inheritance from Tahrir. It also runs into the problem of rec replicability, right? Um, so uh, the things that were exciting in Egypt uh, or in Spain uh, are things that are not the same here. And this is, I think, the point that Aaron was making, right? Um, that, 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 like, it was confronted with a very different situation, a very specific situation. And this is one of the things, I think, that is not talked about enough about uh, the St. Paul's encampment was uh, this kind of strange inflection of, like, the religious mode into uh, the entire camp by virtue of being on the steps of St. Paul's. It's a really very, very strange subjectivity. Uh, this sort of messianism, actually, which you know, is kind of worrying. Um, but, but so, like, this is to say that, look, I mean, you know, when we're looking at the history of, of things that have taken off, like this is a moment to say what were, uh, what were the lacks and absences which allowed this to take root and allowed this to be attractive. I mean, this is not a surprising thing to say. Uh, the other thing to say is, is, is this point uh, from the back uh, about uh, what I think is actually a question about vision. Uh, and this is a thing that I think has been uh, bandied around today. I know Mark, I didn't get a chance to see Mark this morning, but I know Mark Fisher talks about it a lot, uh, it is the kind of like com complete collapse of, of vision, uh, the ability to say, and I think you know, Simon and Luke also talking about this to some extent. This is, this is very, very difficult. And I mean, one of the things that, that, that really wasn't visible in the Occupy movement, nor indeed in, in that multiplicity of other movements that, that we have sort of talked about, so the Buchanan Cart or, uh, or the student movement, for instance, is the lack of a, a kind of unifying political vision. And, and I think this is both sort of uh, uh, instructive uh, and worrying, right? It's instructive in, in the one sense in that like, there, there is, I think, unquestionably, a hesitation about proposing grand visions, partly because of the failure of grand projects in the course of the 20th century. Uh, the, the hesitation to propose a kind of grand solution uh, for the fear of stepping up to one's waist in blood. Like, this is, this is I think, a very real uh, anxiety, a very real fear, and it's one that shouldn't be talked down. It's one that, you know, we should, you know, our response should not be to say, like, look, no, you have just simply failed to grasp that we have a really good vision of communism. We can make it happen. It'll be great. Um, like, so, so, the question about vision is, is really that we, that we need to work from, from, <laughs> from where people are. That sounds like a horrible management speak uh, nonsense. But, 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 but what that means in practice is, is to say so things that I do find hopeful, like so, you know, the various actions around workfare. I don't think they offer us a grand vision for the future, but they do start to give us an opportunity to talk, talk to people about their material conditions and to say that, look, our grand vision is not unified and complete. Uh, it has changed... By the, by the way in which we take our political journey. Nonetheless, uh, we reckon that your life is pretty shit as it is, and we can probably do it a bit better. Okay. Thanks, James. Um, okay, uh, so there's no more time for any more questions from the floor, I'm afraid. I'm trying to keep it to 75 minutes. Um, I suppose normally at this point as chair, I might sort of bring this into some grand synthesis and uh, denouement, um, but I think that's beyond my capabilities. So what I thought I'd do instead is give each of our speakers 30 seconds to sort of leave us with a final thought, and then we can perhaps continue some of the discussion. So a strict 30 seconds, guys. Okay, starting with, again, Aaron. Um, in answer to Nick's question, you're saying what kind of organisations are going to go into yeah, working class communities? There's no point having a mass organisation do it if they're not listening. It could be five million members. If they're not listening, it doesn't matter. Um, and it doesn't matter if they're telling what they're doing. If they're going there, they go, you're rioting, what you're doing is wrong, you're idiots. Unless they're offering support and solidarity and they're listening, does, it's irrelevant. Yeah. Um, I mean, capitalism also, I would say, has no grand vision. And so um, that's if we keep exposing that and then...
actually listen to how people are already organizing and are living their lives, which is not sort of the rationalist actor theory. Like, we, we actually genuinely do care about each other. And some of the really beautiful things in the camps were that people cared about people that they didn't know from before they sort of met them face to face and asked them political and had a political discussion. It's like Greek City Square. It's great. Um, how do we re repl replicate that? We can't do it in the same way. We have to find different ways. And yeah, move on. Thank you. And James? Uh, yeah, I guess the thing I ask people to go away with is uh, to avoid sort of the scylla of academic retreat into purely discursive modes of practice and uh, the charybdis of like pure actionism, uh, which will end up sort of with you sort of headbutting a brick wall for the rest of your life. I uh, love the image to end on. Uh, so if you join me in thanking our three speakers. Thanks, guys.